Dzień dobry Państwu. Witam na debacie Fundacji Mienia Stefana Batora. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the Politica Weekly and Batora Foundation discussion. And there's going to be a cycle of meetings. And we are going to talk about Ukraine. And this is the first meeting in the, in the series of Voice, Voices of Ukraine. And we would like to try to map up the uh, topics that we're going to discuss during the ongoing uh, meetings. And the objective is uh, quite simple. A lot is being said about Ukraine, about the war in Ukraine, that is, um, <clears throat> in fact, um, has been going on for eight years now. And uh, right now, this uh, war has moved into the next phase of great intensity in, and brutality. This is what we see, and we believe and in this um, debate, uh, as we're going to talk about Ukraine and the future of Ukraine, and also we're going to talk about the future of the world after the war. And it is important to give the floor uh, to experts and uh, to listen uh, to uh, people of culture, experts um, and the journalists in Ukraine, so as uh, to understand better what is happening, what is it that they're fighting for, what are their aspirations, and how do they see um, the future for themselves, the country, and the world, as they are a member of European and global community. And hence, we're going to invite, and just in a minute, we're going to um, introduce you to our today's uh, guests, but we will have more guests uh, in the future. And uh, in the future, we we're going to invite um, um, uh, scientists, uh, politicians, journalists, uh, um, experts, um, people of culture, so as uh, to hear firsthand about uh, how Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, think about this situation, um, the situation that witnessing so that we will have a possibility of uh, running a better dialogue. And as I've said before, we are organizing this meeting in cooperation with the Politica Weekly. We are providing for simultaneous interpretation into the Polish, Ukrainian, and English languages, so that everyone will have an opportunity uh, to listen to us, uh, and also Kim Kiklinska and Maika are helping us with interpreting into the sign language. And the participants of the uh, first meeting, um, and the first meeting is devoted to, to the question, what is it that Ukraine is fighting for? And uh, today, alphabetically, we have the following participants. The first person who is going to, to speak um, will be Yevgen Hlubovitsky, board member of public broadcasting company of Ukraine, and also a founder of the Analytical Center Promova. And recently, his text, which is an adaptation of a lecture on the 30th anniversary of um, independence of Ukraine, was published by us, by the Batora Foundation. Also together with us, we have Natalia Humaniuk, a journalist, um, and she's the founder of the Public Interest Journalism Laboratory. And um, this is the lab that uh, where one can read. And uh, in fact, uh, it is a very highly esteemed uh, source of information, uh, Washington Post and um, other um, important Editorial houses are using this lab. Also together with us, we have Yaroslav Hrycek, a Ukrainian historian um, from the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. And he is very well known to the Polish readers. And uh, uh, many of his books have been translated into the Polish language. And undoubtedly, those who are interested in Ukraine have uh, read his books. And he is very much active in the Polish mass media. And uh, also together with us, we have Maria Zolkina, a uh, political scientist, a political analyst. Uh, she is linked with the Ilka Kucharev Democratic Initiatives Foundation. And uh, she is also a very much uh, known specialist. On uh, many occasions, she has uh, spoken at the events organized by the Batori Foundation. So we're very happy to see her today. And. Um, as I've said before, this uh, meeting is uh, being actually interpreted uh, into four languages, and together with us, um, 
and uh, we also cooperate with Vidokop and the Ukrainsky uh, Dean in Warsaw, who are our media partners. So this is uh, it uh, as far as the introduction is concerned, and uh, let us um, make a brief introduction to the today's discussion. Yesterday, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, former president of the Russian Federation, today the deputy head of the Security Council of the Russian Federation, wrote a very weird text in the Telegram. And um, he is presenting the objectives of Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis the world. And uh, I'm not going to sum up the entire text because this is not what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, but um, in fact, uh, he lists uh, the targets that have already been presented by Putin, that is denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. But um, he um, develops this idea by saying that the idea is not only to succeed in the in this uh, special operation, as they call it, but to change the level of awareness of Ukrainians. And once that is done, only then there will be a possibility of building Eurasia from uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok. I'm not going to talk about a text written by uh, uh, Putin, uh, it's more interesting uh, to listen to the words of uh, President Zelensky. And President Zelensky yesterday said that uh, such ideas as denazification and demilitarization of uh, Ukraine, this is not the, the topic that has been discussed during uh, the peace talks. That is not the topic. And full stop on that. But uh, I would like to raise another issue. And that would be a question to Yaroslav uh, Ritsak. So several weeks ago, um, a very much known um, a journalist and a poet, um, a Russian poet, uh, Dmitry Bikov, linked with Nova Gazeta, wrote, or actually said, but then it was uh, published, but then it was removed by Russian censorship. And he wrote, um, uh, had a brief statement uh, saying that Putin de facto lost and that, he, that Putin lost um, um, uh, the Russian leadership in uh, the uh, Slav world. And uh, now it's uh, Ukrainian leadership in the Slav world because uh, Ukraine has shown a new model of society for the 21st century and Ukraine shows the new um, model of um, uh, the political leadership because um, Zelensky is, a, as he says, trickster who is an optimum of uh, figure for the 21st century, and uh, Yaroslav Hrycek responded to uh, those ideas voiced by Bikov, but uh, his reply was quite brutal, and you didn't like what Bikov said. So you completely disagree um, with that idea that Ukraine is aspiring to the leadership in the Slav world. So if not this effect of the confrontation, so what is it that Ukraine is fighting for? Professor, over to you. Is this the question to me? Yes, that's the question to you. Um, Latina also uh, repeated the words of uh, Bekov, uh, another intellectual leading uh, anti-Putin intellectual, and um, uh, and uh, she said uh, that Moscow Russia is over, and, uh, and uh, now it's uh, Ukrainian Russia time, but it's. Uh, over with any type of Russia. There is neither uh, Putin's Russia nor Ukrainian Russia because we do not have this ambition of being in any combination with the Russians. N uh, uh, besides uh, the Poles, the Czechs, uh, Slovaks are also Slavs uh, and Croatians and uh, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Poles and uh, uh, Slovenians uh, are in the European Union. We also want to go to the EU. Uh, Rus uh, is uh, not the... Um, uh, target uh, for us is not our objective and uh, our main objective is European integration. This is why the war started. And um, uh, was it uh, just a brief question or should I um, uh, continue with uh, my statement? And please tell us, um, so to what extent these um, <coughs> ideas of Bikov and then of um, 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 
of uh, Latinian. Those um, uh, the ideas that were presented a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they said those ideas, voiced those ideas a couple of weeks ago, but now the war has probably changed your way of thinking. So, uh, so what um, the um, aspirations of Ukraine uh, is this aspiration of integrating with the EU becoming ever stronger, or perhaps uh, this uh, idea needs some adjustment? And uh, for instance, um, there, was, there is a rating that was published yesterday that shows um, the public opinion in Ukraine, and it shows that more than 90% of Ukrainians are in favor of Ukraine uh, becoming a member of the EU. And uh, they're convinced that this is going to happen fairly quickly within several years. So what do you think about that? <coughs> well, there is, <coughs> uh, there is no uh, major change in that because um, um, in fact, um, uh, for the last 10 or 15 years, Ukraine was um, aspiring uh, to the EU. So always the EU option has been prevailing over any other option. But what is new in this situation is after the Russian annexation of Crimea and also uh, once uh, the war s started, um, <clears throat> Ukrainians now want to join not only the EU but also NATO. And this is the change. So before that, we had this idea <clears throat> and some of the Ukrainian elites I thought um, that uh, it would be possible to join the EU without NATO because um, in the past we were looking at the, uh, at the Polish Republic and the Czech Republic and we thought that perhaps our path might be different. But now the war has changed uh, our opinions. There is no other way. There is no other path. There is no other choice. It's both the EU and NATO. And this is the direct answer to uh, this. This is the um, result of the war. Uh, because uh, now this is an existential matter for us, so we cannot exist as a neutral country. Because being a neutral country, this is a dangerous situation and it doesn't solve any problems. And also uh, neutrality, <clears throat> neutrality will become much more expensive. Uh, it's uh, in fact uh, much more expensive than being a NATO, NATO member state. So the idea is plain simple. We want security. We want, do not want to be in the buffer zone. And the only way to run out of this uh, buffer zone is uh, to join the Euro-Atlantic integration umbrella. Can we do it? Well, actually, that is uh, the result of the war. So this war is not about language. This war is not about culture. It's about our the strategic choice of Ukraine. It's about the place of Ukraine in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we shall revisit this issue. And now I would like to move on to um, uh, Mrs. Maria Zolkinen. Let's talk about uh, security. That is the other aspect that is also related, that is related to uh, the aspirations of uh, NATO membership. And if we look at uh, the, the talks with Russia, we see that um, this issue is put on the back banner and President Zelensky says that um, Ukraine does not um, uh, resign from her aspirations and uh, NATO should be ready to admit, uh, to invite Ukraine. So he also sends the signal to Russia that uh, NATO membership is in fact a topic uh, that needs to be discussed. <clears throat> and um, uh, some other people are talking about enigmatic security guarantees. And Mrs. Olkina um, <clears throat> uh, presented her opinions on that matter. Um, and um, uh, Mrs. Olkina is uh, against this um, attitude. So, uh, what could you tell us about the security guarantees for Ukraine? Thank you. The security dilemma that Ukraine faces is not about NATO. That's uh, my entry point. That's the first point. It's not about NATO. And so, the, if uh, Ukraine resigns so from NATO membership ID, it does not mean that we will become a more secure country, especially in the context of Russia, so, because Russia needs not only Ukraine to abandon the idea of NATO membership, but Ukraine, the Russians want the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian defense system to be incapable of um, uh, withstanding any direct or hybrid aggression um, launched by Russia, and we will be faced by possible aggression in the future, perhaps uh, not in the same shape and form as today, but Russia in the nearest future will not be a friendly state. And um, in the liberal sense, uh, 
uh, Russia is not going to be a friendly state or acceptable state for Ukraine. So the conditions that they're tabling, it's not only about NATO, because if, um, if the problem were only about NATO membership, this is whether Ukraine becomes a member of NATO or not then. But by the way, I'm fully in favor of NATO, of uh, Ukrainians' membership in NATO, and I think there is no other uh, alternative um, from the point of security uh, for Ukraine. And um, so far, Russia uh, <clears throat> has not yet uh, tested uh, NATO for its uh, uh, strength of response, uh, and perhaps uh, NATO's response might be very much different uh, from what has been uh, so far, because NATO and member states have been thinking about uh, arms uh, um, supplies, and uh, right now there is talk about giving uh, a defense system and so forth, but perhaps NATO may, may have a very different response to Russia, and so Russia does have a barrier, and so Ru the Russians are still facing barriers. So. There is no other alternative to NATO on the European continent today. However, if Ukraine <coughs> decided to resign from uh, this movement towards NATO membership, then in lieu of that, Ukraine would need to have an adequate alternative. And what would be such an alternative? <coughs> that would be some other defense or security uh, alliance uh, similar to NATO, so it will be mini NATO, so to speak. So some of those countries may be either members of the of NATO or members of the EU, but those are the countries that are facing similar challenges as Ukraine. So I'm talking about Eastern European countries. This is Poland. It's about um, the UK. The UK is uh, far from the eastern borders of the EU and NATO, but the UK has uh, many common interests um, <clears throat> together with us encountering Russia and uh, the UK is interested in improving security on the European uh, continent. So that such alliances may serve us as a compromise, as an adequate response. But the point is that the Russian Federation is not going to sign any agreements with Ukraine if <coughs> Ukraine, as a result of such an agreement, will have a right to some common or joint security policy or defense in, some, in any other format, not necessarily NATO. Because what Russia needs, Russia needs to have Ukraine as a helpless, defenseless country. And therefore, the Russian Federation is so very much adamant on having on uh, having the neutrality status of Ukraine. Because in the case of neutrality, and if it's official neutrality, then it's not necessarily it's not necessarily uh, to say that Ukraine would need to disarm and would not cooperate in, on security matters with other countries, but in the case of the Istanbul proposals that were uh, voiced by the Ukrainian side last week in Istanbul, there we see a very different situation because we are talking about some security guarantees for Ukraine that uh, we do not actually know who is going to give to Ukraine. We don't know what's, how such security guarantees are going to look like. And diplomats say, let us wait because the negotiation process is going on. But I am a person I have uh, I have been uh, uh, taking part in uh, the Donbas talks since 2014, and I can tell you that none of the Western partners, including Poland, including the UK, including the US, who are for today are the uh, biggest partners for Ukraine. So the three mentioned, uh, the three listed, are uh, the three most important partners for Ukraine. None of them is going to give Ukraine the security guarantees that would. Uh, uh, present a real alternative to NATO, and they're not going to give us guarantees. And for the same reason why we're not admitted to NATO today, because they are afraid that this may provoke Russia's uh, aggression against those countries. And therefore, we are in a vicious circle. So why should we officially resign from our NATO aspirations? And why should we uh, talk about, why should we talk about some illusionary security guarantees if uh, Eventually, we will end up one on one. In order to give the floor to others, we're not without taking time. Let me give you this example. Let's imagine the worst case scenario, as in my opinion, for Ukraine, that Ukraine signs now, not perhaps tomorrow, because Russia is not ready. Russia will try to occupy another part of Ukraine, at a minimum in Donbass and the south of Ukraine, and it will try to 
get entrenched in Kherson and Zaporizhia Oblast, and only after that the Russian Federation will attempt to uh, make an agreement with Ukraine so that they would get a temporary reprieve and relief before further aggression. Let's imagine the worst case scenario that Ukraine, Ukraine agrees to be a, a non-aligned, out of a non-blocked country. And if there are various countries, there are various countries, we heard about the list, a list of various countries in Istanbul, uh, from Israel, which is not friendly to Ukraine, to China, that is also uh, has acquired an unfriendly stance, and all the way to Great Britain, which is uh, one of our key partners. So, so that there's a an idea that all these countries could be put together in a list of guarantors. How would that guarantees look like? If all if all these different countries are going to sign up to this list, that means there will be no guarantee in principle because there can't be Britain and Poland to pr promising the same help on one hand that cannot be given and proposed and put forward in Israel or China according to their stances now that means it's just it's an it's a no, it's nothing so that would result in the situation that Ukraine will end up it will find itself in a much worse situation that we had uh, ourselves after the after 1994 1994 Budapest memorandum because after 94, Ukraine was not limited and restricted in its desire to join NATO. The proposals that are now being discussed stipulate, among other things, a possible ban for Ukraine as a neutral country, not only to join NATO, but any other defense alliances. And this is the biggest trap that we can find ourselves in. So therefore, I very much hope that Ukrainian diplomats will negotiate for the sake of humanitarian corridors for the evacuation of for the sake of evacuating the civilians for the sake of stopping acts of genocide in the temporary on the temporarily occupied territories and cities of ukraine but a final stop will be put when ukrainian armed forces not not through the dipl a diplomatic but through military way are going to stop the advance of the russian army not only as they did in the north of ukraine but also in the nearest future i wish them life and health to all of them fighting for ukraine in this in the east and south in the south because the ukrainian armed forces are fighting not only for ukraine and for themselves because in the beginning you actually Ask the question for what on for the sake of what ukraine is fighting ukraine is not only fighting for the sake of its existence and for the sake of being a sovereign independent country as a, as a, and a and a nation so that we would not be identified as a neighboring or junior country to that to russia we are fighting in my opinion for the fact that the european countries and the western democratic world as a whole would stop looking at Russia as a sacred cow. I'm sorry about this undiplomatic term. That cannot be touched. That should be actually, and it should be uh, talked to and held counsel with. The big politics is clear. It should actually have a balance of interest in mind, but it doesn't stipulate, it shouldn't stipulate that a huge country with a huge impact on the economy of other countries can and may violate the fundamental principles of coexistence of various countries as they were set out after the Second World War. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. And thank you for reminding about the obvious thing that we ask everybody here what Ukraine is fighting for. And also the question is to Natalia Humanyuk for that, about that. Again, with the same question, what Ukraine is fighting for, but also was an attempt to look at and clarify the phenomenon which fascinates the world. I mean, the position, the stance of the Ukrainian society. One can see it through public opinion polls and the ratings that are published. The level of optimism of Ukrainian is on the rise. That's the highest indicator. Yesterday's poll said 90% of Ukrainians believe, more than 90% believe that this war will be victorious for Ukraine. And I think this is going in the right good direction. Only 25% in February 
in February was the number. So that war changed the opinion. So that's the statistics. So in various parts of Ukraine, speaking to people in various parts of Ukraine. So could you say, could you talk to us about how that looks like? What, what it looks like from the point of view of those Ukrainians that you are talking to. What is happening in the Ukrainian society? Because this is the moment now. Is there a new, something new is creating or the continuation of what we saw and observed on the Maidan? I mean, what's in your opinion going on here? Good afternoon to everyone. I my greetings from Kiev. Today in the morning, I had a feeling that everything is still not safe, but there's a feeling of victory, the feeling of that Kiev in this battle that was fought at a very hard price, but managed to defend itself. It's not the end though, but I believe it's important that Kiev is going back to life. I will answer this question. I believe that we all, are still, and I, I'm included, have not really realized to what extent, to what historical extent, at the very profound level, these things are, that they are happening. What I would call a profound democracy, a real democracy for the world. The meaning for, meaning and impact on that. We did a lot of research. I worked with Peter Pomeranz with about sociological, civil nation about Ukrainian democracy. But what's important to emphasize is that during such terrible events, such important events, I believe people actually manifest themselves and they change themselves. Probably those who were standing aside, they actually come forward and manifest themselves. Therefore, if we were talking about a civil identity of the Ukrainians, we're not talking about a full manifestation of it. I would like to uh, continue the discussion about NATO and about what my colleagues were talking about to just complete this story. I believe, indeed, I've visited 12 regions of Ukraine over this time frame, apart from Chernihiv, Chernihiv region, where the uh, hostilities were taking, but I was going to the east to the south, small and big towns and cities, and there were a lot of processes underway in there first about NATO. It was interesting to hear one of my interlocutors, I was talking to a transgender community in Odessa, it was a young girl of 20 plus years from Odessa, transgender girl, and she said, you know, NATO, they are cowards. Our army knows how to fight. And I, I was talking to Ukrainian armed forces. They're not criticizing. They're thankful to the West for the support, but they believe now that yes, there's no bravado here, but they are confident that for the sake of Ukraine's security, we can only count on ourselves and the support, but not the support and then ourselves. But first and foremost, they, we should rely on our own strengths. And in this case, I believe that there is a readiness of the people to some kind of compromise, but I mean, not compromise on the territory matters, but the compromise and the perception that some agreement is possible. Another thing is, I, can, I will continue, I will, I believe like Ms. Maria, like Ms. Maria, I was part of various negotiations, including the Donbass, including with the participation of the Russian side. These are people, these people are bad communicators, but sometimes they keep writing to me. Uh, they said, we listen to you on CNN and we can state that now, for now, nothing except defense and military and hostilities on the ground is not impacting the Kremlin. Nothing. The sanctions, nothing. Only military victories of Ukraine impact what the Kremlin is doing. Full stop. It was important for me to hear that. I think it's a very good introduction for our future continued conversation. But what Ukraine is fighting for really I travel a lot and I apologize, I'll take some time, but I want to convey it to you. This time, we often, often we talk about multi-ethnicity. I met with, I met Bulgarians, the Greeks, the Romas, the Armenians, the Abkhazians, the Georgians, the Azeris, Jews, the Jews, the Russians, the Ukrainians. Those all who said, for example, with a clear identity of theirs, 
They, those people who are helping people, who are doing something in Zaporizhia, in Odessa, the Greek who was born in Greece, but has been living here for 20 years and says, it's my country. The Armenian guy who was born in a village near Zaporizhia and who is now helping this village and this and his church, but he's saying in our country of Ukraine and then talks about Armenia, a Georgian construction worker who's helping his Zaporizhia colleague to build something out there to repair the, bro the bombed out house. And he's saying in our country of Ukraine and there in Georgia, I left Abhazia during the war. It's important in my opinion to understand. And in fact, this is a big part of what's going on with Ukraine. But speaking about democracy and what is Ukraine fighting for? Ukraine is fighting for the value of human life. It, it's fighting for the rules to exist in the that the rules should exist in the world because Ukraine believe if there are no rules in the world that's not the world that should exist. When we mean, say rules, we mean very clearly. And I asked people, you know, what really caused me to be surprised was that a mayor of a small town of Ochtirka quite openly and candidly was saying that his town was a front line to ensure that the rule of law works in the world, that this rule of law has the right to exist. He believes firmly that his town is fighting for that. I was also talking to one of the may, one of the leading rabbis in uh, Dnipri. He's from Brooklyn. And he said, you know, I'm from the States. I've been living here for 30 years. I've thought that democracy is just about better living conditions. I'm used to it, that this is about better living standards compared to the Soviet Union. That's how my family was thinking and talking to me about during the Soviet Union years. But here we're fighting for a different kind of democracy. Finally, I understood 30 years later in Ukraine, living in Ukraine, I, I realized it's about the right of choosing, the right of choice. There's a woman who was talking to me. I believe she, I would classify her as a middle class Odessa lady who's been who was born and lived in Odessa all her, her entire life. She was a deputy mayor of a Russian speaking city. She told me, we're fighting for peace. When I asked her, she said, uh, I said, I asked, what is, what does peace mean for you? Peace, she said, is when we're not going to be told what president we should elect. And she was not talking to me as a deputy mayor. She was talking to me as somebody who's got a nephew in Mariupol with whom she could not communicate for three, who was out of touch for three weeks. And that's exactly what others were talking about. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in my writings, in my materials that I produce, I'm trying to talk to people of various, from various strata of the society. And this profound understanding of democracy as the right to choose that nobody can and should not force people to define their views and to decide what they have to choose. And this is such a profound feeling, be it an, an old lady in Zaporizhia or a bureaucrat from Sumer region or an, a volunteer, or be it a volunteer, a 30 plus guy from Zaporizhia who is a volunteer, who's absolutely not an activist type, uh, as we understand them, really active activists. This is such a profound, serious, right to choose or if you look at a, at a worker from odessa who is a construction worker who is a actually a and also there's a, a lady who is a very is she's a worker and she's a fitting lady as a, as a, as a man as a manual labor work worker the transgender lady from there. So this is the profound understanding of democracy that they share. Another thing, I mean, this is how I understand it. And what, this is not what was happening and before, but we have to look at it now and understand it now. It's very interesting that Zelensky, as president, talking to my colleague, he said that he was addressing the peoples. If And if alliances don't work sometimes, he is appealing to the alliance of the peoples. And it's a very interesting thing. It's, it seems to me that as well in Europe and in the world at large, a lot of citizens, a lot of people feel that the technocrats are out there and therefore they don't, they feel that they are not in touch with the NATO, with the European Union. In our case, we are appealing to, and calling for the real democracy that requires a different sense, a different meaning that 
under the crisis, under these conditions that we're doing, added new blood and new life to all these institutions who were established with peace and freedom in mind, but who over a period of time became bureaucratic and rigid. Ukrainians feel it in reality, and they are fighting to ensure that all this meaning, all these senses, freedom, rights of uh, human rights, democracy, were taken and translated from the technocratic language of bureaucrats and civil societies became values of citizens in the society and acquired a real meaning. Thank you very much. Thank you for such a great um, way of putting it that allows me to, that creates a conduit to Mr. Ivan Halibovitsky, who is actually going to take second right. And we're talking about not only the situation in the Ukrainian society, but it's also we're talking about the resilience of the Ukrainian state. Mr. Halibovitsky uh, was uh, saying in his text on the 30th anniversary of Ukraine, and the text was published in Poland, about the uh, delayed war of independence uh, for independence in Ukraine. But you said that the result of that, that was the result of many years of colonialism that denied Ukraine the right of its own state. We should look at the state now uh, this way. It's, it's a state, but it's kind of a weak state that uh, that is only what Moscow wanted us to believe. But it turns out, turned out that you, the Ukrainian state is very strong, not only in the military sense, it's, such, it's obvious now, we, we're witnessing what the Ukrainian army is doing, but also it's a strong state, surprisingly, from the point of view in, of state institutions uh, for operations, how are they doing, how the infrastructure, critical infrastructure is operating. This is also a surprise for, for, for you, as it turned out that that was kind of a unexpected thing that happened under this crisis, that the state is so resilient in this situation. And also a question is for you as well, what is Ukraine fighting for as well? So, I think the key question has it's very specific answer. Ukraine is fighting for its for being a subject of the world policy and for the opportunity to implement its to live its life and living the way Ukrainians want. What is more, Ukraine is fighting in this case not only for its being a subject and Ukrainians being subjects, but also for others to be a subject uh, against imperial forces. We see that, as a matter of fact, now the question is put very straightforwardly, whether Russia is going to fall and drag the entire set of imperial methodology methods of dealing with other countries in the world that are operating that work now right there we are looking at certain aspects linked or related to this war we can often see the western approach is a colonial approach one of the examples i can give you is this a significant part of Western intelligence services, media experts, simply did not ac accept the fact that, the Uc that Ukraine could have enough strength to deter, to resist the Russian army, not because the state is not capable, but just simply because it's, because there was a huge gap in the scales and historic experience. Uh, answering your question about what's happening in Ukraine, a gigantic shift is taking place in Ukraine. Ukraines are beginning to find their own state. If before that, one of the key indicators that I was paying attention during social uh, the poll, public poll opinions, public opinion polls, there was a feeling of Ukraine's alien, Ukrainians' alienation from the state. You, the Ukrainians over the last 100 years of living historic memory only had to deal with this state that was not accountable to them that could be a threat that could 
that viewed its citizens as a resort, but not as self-sufficient citizenry. But now there is an attempt to build a, a different type of relationship with the country. So I think that the internal Ukrainian optics is different from the external optics. So for instance, uh, President Zelensky has record high support, enjoys record high level of support. Uh, none of the Ukrainian presidents has ever had ever had this level of support, which is not to say that tomorrow Ukrainians will be um, <clears throat> ready uh, to uh, solve all of the problems and uh, there are problems with logistics there are problems with um, uh, with uh, water mains with utilities uh, but it's those are not only state matters we're talking about a huge number of volunteers who are helping there is um, a huge number of companies that have changed the <coughs> profile of activities so if we look from inside the internal perspective is such that we see that uh, Ukrainians uh, uh, could not face some of the challenges, uh, could not face uh, some of the challenges, could not deal, address some of the challenges. So thousands of Ukrainian companies um, started buying bulletproof vests in the West. As a result of this, the uh, we are now see all-time high prices uh, for the bulletproof vests. Uh, so in the past, one could buy such a vest uh, at a price, but now this price is five x of that price. And uh, <clears throat> if we were to exercise a single buyer attitude, then uh, this could be done in a different way. We could buy cheaper, faster, and more. However. The Ukrainian economy, economy of uh, Ministry of Economy has not been able to mediate this process. As a result of this failure, we have hundreds and thousands of companies, small companies uh, that uh, are uh, dealing on their own. So yes, there is a big change and we see that we have matured. We have become uh, more of a subject, uh, but uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, we should not exaggerate uh, with uh, the things that we can do because we cannot possibly have an ideally seamlessly running state um, overnight. Uh, a change is happening and the change is happening at the base level, at the level of social contract and Ukrainian, the Ukrainians after this war will have a different attitude to the Ukrainian state. They will see that this is their own instrument. Uh, so the state is not going to be their master, it's their instrument, which is good, but this is not enough yet. And uh, this is a necessary, but not a sufficient precondition to build institutions. Institution building will take a lot of time. Thank you very much. And the next round, I would like to begin with Maria Zolkina. And let us continue on uh, our talk about NATO security and the complexity of this issue of uh, security guarantees. And we understand um, that um, uh, actually all depends now on uh, the effectiveness of the uh, military operation. But uh, what are the uh, peace conditions uh, that Ukrainians will be ready to accept? The research show that uh, the condition for true peace uh, would be the return of Crimea and the return of uh, those um, uh, territories that have, were temporarily occupied. And as far as negotiations are concerned, we see that uh, the president speaks about the withdrawal of uh, Russian troops beyond the borders uh, uh, before uh, February the 24th. So what do you think is the real objective and what is the time frame? Well, as far as the time frame is concerned, I think we should not talk about the dates yet. And um, if um, the Ukrainian army um, beats the hell out of the Russians in the Donbass, I'm pardon my French, 
because uh, but we we know that the Russians are mostly now in the Donbas area in the temporarily occupied areas and uh, if uh, a Ukrainian military do a great, a great job then we will be very happy and we will thank our soldiers but um, if it all is procrastinated and more resources are necessary then perhaps we should not promise things even if the military are not promising things we should not promise those and recently lately when i talk to the military their position is very optimistic and me as a citizen and me as an analyst it's uh, quite inspiring for me to see them being so optimistic and i talk to many different uh, military in many different regions of ukraine and they all say the same message everything's going to be just fine we're definitely capable of uh, defeating the Russian army and um, don't worry if we are not counteroffensive. It's uh, not yet time to start a counteroffensive in some directions, but we're planning. We are evaluating the situation. We're not losing. We're not wasting our uh, weapons, people and resources if we are not sure that it's, good, not, uh, it's not going to succeed. We're planning and working just the way it should be done uh, during the war. And this is what I hear from many different people. Uh, from uh, This is what I hear from the military. So I do not have this urge, neither as a citizen nor as an analyst, to have any deadlines. And I would warn everyone against uh, following, uh, following uh, the hype news that are um, broadcast by newsmakers in Ukraine that in two weeks we're going to celebrate victory. We're going to celebrate it then when we win. This is it. And as far as the peace conditions are concerned, well, I would say the following. The Ukrainian society definitely, irreversibly, just to make it clear, because um, of course there may be some details, minor details about, but let's start with the end. First and foremost, the Ukrainian society shall not agree with any further territorial loss, no more territorial losses. Moreover, the situation in the Donbass the occupied Donbass <clears throat> is uh, now perceived um, by some in the Ukrainian society as an opportunity to liberate the entire region. And on the official level, on the diplomatic level, uh, such statements are not being made. And even if the military and political leaders have such plans or may have such plans, then I am convinced they're not going to talk about such plans in public. So if the operation that is the counter-offensive operation is successful and we are capable of liberating the earlier occupied territories in the Donbass region, then we will, we will see the facts. And But right now it's uh, premature. We are not going to um, interrupt uh, talks with the Russian Federation if we make a statement that we're going to move back um, to the borders so that we're there between 1991 and 2014. <clears throat> but the Ukrainian society definitely is not going to accept any more territorial losses. Now, as far as the security guarantees are concerned, the Ukrainian society shall not agree um, with um, the absence of such security guarantees. And the Ukrainian society is very democratic and pluralistic. And even though the, the mass media are now being re strictly regulated, but still, there is discussion and there are many different opinions and there is a lot of discussion going on within the Ukrainian society and it's a serious discussion. Therefore, if they uh, suggest um, having a Budapest Memorandum number two, then uh, it's going to be quite a critical discussion in the Ukrainian society and uh, a significant part of uh, society would treat that as uh, a um, as abandoning some strategic positions of Ukraine. So. Some alliance says, is it possible to replace some alliances with some other alliances? Yes, maybe it is possible, but what's in it for us? And um, if there is an agreement, is anyone going to enforce such an agreement? And it's going to be a realistic <clears throat> um, alliance. Um, is it going to reinforce uh, NATO that we, that is still our ultimate goal? Or is it going to replace NATO? That, that's a point in discussion. But... <clears throat> guarantees should be effective. So we need to be 
capable of developing of our armed forces once uh, the combat operation stops and once the Russian troops are out. And uh, undoubtedly, we should not be limited in the choice of our military partners and the security guarantees should not um, deprive Ukraine of membership in any new defense alliance, because that would be the uh, encroachment on the sovereignty of Ukraine. So if we strike out these three unacceptable terms, and um, if we we have security guarantees that uh, um, will give them some sense of protection and give us possible contingent of force in the case of an aggression, then we can talk. Now, let us talk about the results of the public opinion polling between 2014 and 2020. And if we look at the public opinion polls on the Donbass, whenever the Russians, either militarily, as a result of a military operation, or for instance, with, as the result of Svetlodarsk or the Baltsova, and um, or as a result of diplomatic pressure exerted on Ukraine in 2016, 17, 18, and 19. Every time, whenever the Russian Federation was trying to impose some unacceptable terms for Ukraine, but uh, the Russians were saying that it would be a compromise, but that would mean that uh, Ukraine would need to abandon some positions, uh, but the Ukrainian public opinion uh, was going against it. So the more pressure was exerted on us by the Russian Federation, the more Ukrainians uh, were against the concessions, the trade-offs the Russians were demanding. So I think that the current stage of the war against the Russia has not changed that. So the Ukrainians, nine of 10 of Ukrainians are sure of victory. And to conclude, I would like to say, 10 or 14 days ago, I, I wrote an article uh, for the Western readership, and it was uh, being reviewed many times. And I even had suspicions uh, that uh, it was not really comfortable for the Western readers, uh, but The Guardian uh, finally published it. And the point is that friends, Dear friends, you are looking at different scenarios of the development of this war. However, nowhere do we see a scenario that includes uh, the point, the issue of helping Ukraine to win and uh, to reinstate territorial int uh, integrity. And this is where we need to focus on both our diplomatic and military efforts. So army needs to be armed. And uh, diplomatically, we should not weaken the strategic position of Ukraine. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Natalia Humenyuk. And let's talk about the social matters. You spoke about the pluralistic society and you yourself described this mechanism, how it all works in uh, the current uh, situation. And you spoke about the current role and uh, significance of democracy and uh, you spoke about uh, the significance of the possibility of democratic choice. And we, let's, for instance, we uh, let's um, uh, have a look at those who are fighting. Uh, there are LGBT fighters, the anarchists of uh, fighters. And um, <clears throat> on the right hand side, we have Azov in Mariupol, who is um, fighting in Mariupol uh, right now. So we see a very broad array of people with different ideas, with different ideologies still fighting. But is it possible to maintain this momentum after the war? I know that before the war, uh, there were many tensions and um, uh, for instance, we know that they, uh, there was uh, quite a conservative attitude with regard to LGBT and there were problems with uh, organizing a pride parade uh, in Kiev, uh, then it changed. Uh, so do you think there is a possibility to reinforce or uh, to provide for the process of institutionalization of pluralism in the Ukrainian society? <clears throat> Perhaps uh, I would uh, speak in uh, broader terms and I would correct. Um, yes, it was a good explanation by one of the analysts of the right-wing movements that Azov is a very different story today. 
because Azov is now a unit of the National Guard. Uh, those are um, uh, Ukrainian uh, um, uh, soldiers, and uh, it has nothing in common with the Azov Battalion that used to exist in 2014, on the basis of which Anadry Bilecki, uh, its uh, founder, is uh, playing his game on, on the basis of that particular battalion. But this is a different unit today. And uh, ideologically, they're not driven like the Azov Battalion in 2014. Also speaking about LGBT and pride parades in Kiev. <clears throat> in fact, um, uh, the pride parade was protected by the state, by the police. It's a very different story. And uh, the, the uh, pride parade was attacked by the conservatives. But yes, I. I'm saying that uh, any war is toxic, uh, especially for any society, and it's very difficult to lift a society out of the war. But I would like to add one more interesting thing and uh, to pay, um, to give merit to, to President Zelensky. And of course, um, I can explain that from the point of view of sociology, but if we talk about the majority, President Zelensky understands very well the feelings of the majority. And right now, he is on the same brainwave with the majority. And so, when we speak about uh, different uh, agreements, I would add to what uh, Maria has said. Yes, I understand that there will be different people in offices who will criticize him. <clears throat> and I remember one uh, conversation with a woman, and she is an adamant. Uh, follower of um, Yulia Tymoshenko, and Yulia Tymoshenko said that uh, she could not stand Zelensky because of privatization, land issue, and so forth. And she uh, was saying that in the past she would not go on such a compromise, but now she says she understands that there is, we are facing a very complex choice, and Zelensky himself cannot close the sky. Had we been able to uh, close the sky, we would win on the ground, but he cannot do it on, the, on its own, on his own. <clears throat> and I actually... I, um, uh, and and uh, I see that the same position is presented by governors. Uh, uh, we understand uh, the military power of the Ukrainian soldiers, but the Russians are also massing their forces. There is this uh, tragic situation. I was leaving the Donbass so with this sense of drama. I know that they're going to be killing more people. They're going to burn that land out. They're going to destroy that land. And uh, the head of the Donetsk region said what President Zelensky used to say. Please understand, we're fighting not only for uh, the uh, having only the land of heroes here. I do not uh, want uh, to be the president of um, 300 Spartans, 300 Spartans. And so there is uh, this uh, a dramatic choice, but we can avoid it. On the one hand, people say that we're fighting uh, for uh, the value of human life and uh, the value of freedom. And uh, there is a dilemma. Uh, but I think we should understand that the Ukrainian society is much more moderate today. And even uh, today, President Zelensky, as he speaks about uh, thinking about human life, the value of human life, I see that and, and I see this attitude in so many people. Of course, uh, the, and actually the military understand the value of human life. And yes, I understand that, of course, there will always be such people who would say that freedom above all, even at the price of uh, death. Okay, that's their opinion. But Ukrainians have this understanding of this general perception that's, that we need to make hard choices. We, we do have this understanding. And speaking about the Ukrainian democratic society, I see that Yevgen and Roslav also would like also to talk. <clears throat> but what I think that we need to see the difference of the current situation from the Maidan. Indeed, uh, the state uh, is undergoing a process of institutionalization. It's not that the vo volunteers are supporting whatever the state does, but it actually works. <clears throat> when if we look at the position of the president, mayors and governors, they are nominated in many different ways. Some are appointed, some are elected. Yes, they may be critical. Um, um, towards each other, but now there is a sense of unity in Dnipro, in Dnipropetrovsky uh, region. We have a unique uh, situation because uh, the uh, president used to have a, a conflict with Vilkov uh, in Kriverich, uh, and uh, there was another conflict with the mayor of Dnipro, but now they're working three because they understand that every one of them is responsible for their uh, 
uh, for their office. And uh, so those are the people, the three people who, despite uh, the initial tension, are working, capable of working together. And also, and um, of course, those people are still critical. They're still talking about accountability, but they do cooperate with the authorities in order to provide for people. So I think that actually works. Because there is institution of this state as the as bureaucracy, you, you, volunteers or will never be able to replace the bureaucracy. They will never replace the health ministry, the army, or the the, the household, and 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 all the utilities. I mean, they won't be able to replace it. They won't replace the Ukrainian railways. So we're very often talking about the volunteers, civil society, authorities, and business role in our discussions. I believe it works when it works together in concert, and that's how we succeed. And that a lot of players have come to an accord because they understand there's a value of human life. And when Zelensky appeals to people now, to the soldiers and others, he calls first and foremost upon their emotions to be directed towards caring for each other, not for the hatred against each other. And that's the leader's position becomes a, an example, sets an example, because at a certain point, a certain level, it is well received. Uh, you know, I'm a very much afraid war is very toxic and will be toxic and will be a very difficult withdrawal for us from this. But the way people deal with that the way people handle that is very humanistic in this in its nature how people deal with that and that's what's saving us and that will and can save us thank you very much now to mr yaroslav Hretsak with the following question i would welcome your comment about what has been said already if you have any but my question is you are very much asked to give interviews by foreign media outlets and you're following what's being said in foreign media outlets at foreign media. What is it that we don't understand as a world opinion about what we're talking about here, about the political and societal process in Ukraine? How do you view it? Where is the gap, our problem? in understanding, in comprehending what's happening in Ukraine. And what is it that we do not understand most of, of all? What has to be explained to us in the best possible way? How? Well, first and foremost, I would like to ask to start by saying, by giving compliments to my colleagues. And uh, I caught myself thinking that I would like to speak less and to listen to them more. Well, in answering your question, I think the biggest thing that not you personally, but others, I mean, the collective West doesn't understand. You don't understand Ukraine as a collective West. Let me put it this way, in a provocative way. All you know about Ukraine is not certain. We very often didn't understand Ukraine ourselves because, you know, 30 years ago, suddenly Ukraine emerged and there was Ukraine, the unexpected nation. The book was published. Come on. What we're talking about, Ukraine has been a nation. Then there was a con there was a talk saying, okay, this nation is probably going to last for 10 years, but it'll disappear. No, it's not disappearing. We're supposed to lose in two days. We haven't. You see, we're being accused of being rhetorical and speaking with pathos, but this is it's 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 basically based on the fact that the values of security brings about the values of dignity something that you actually forgetting about yourself the profound the idea of the profound democracy one has to go to ukraine to, to learn it moscow patriarch patriarchy uh, clergy wrote something about Ukraine. If all Christian churches would like to understand what is real, what is what the church is really about, they have to go to Maidan. So if you really want to understand what democracy is all about, you have to be in Ukraine to learn about it in Ukraine. Uh, we are better than NATO, let's face it. But, we, but it's not because we're better. 
I think we are exactly the way we're exactly the way you are. But the existential threat level that we're facing is much higher. But this is how it's manifested. We wouldn't like you to have the same crisis as we do, as we have. But be ready that you may be prepared that you may face it. This is what I want to say to Europe. It's very important. So it's very important for you to understand that because this containment idea that this crisis can be contained within the framework of Ukraine, no, it won't be contained within Ukraine because at, at, at the end of the day, it's not a Ukrainian crisis. It's not even a Russian crisis. It's not even a European crisis, it's a world crisis. We're talking about the, uh, the future of the world. In Ukraine, they, we, we, have, we have a saying, the flies are separate from the uh, from the uh, stakes. Well, this, the flies are sitting on top of the stakes already. So this is not a Ukrainian problem. It's a world problem. Well, please, uh, what I want to say, learn how to see that in earnest and do treat us more seriously than you have been so far. We were not treating ourselves as seriously uh, as we should have before that. This is what I want to say. I also would add another question because we're counting back, uh, that we were reaching a broader audience with the English interpretation, but I'd like to ask a question. Since you're talking about this, and there's an agreement here that this is a world conflict and the world's future is at stake here, what is, the Pol what is Poland's place in this whole setting? What we as a country, as a state can do, how do you uh, view our participation in all this uh, that is happening well i don't know i cannot advise anything to you i can only thank you because what we're feeling is that the countries who are now our neighbors polska uh, Pol uh, the polish help and support is the most manifested the strongest i mean poland has its own limitations but their support is the most manifested and this is also supported by the government that until recently hadn't been very very friendly to ukraine and i'm kind of saying that and i'm happy that the war has changed it all i'm afraid and again i don't want to say that but i'm afraid but i have to say that i think that because of what has has happened i think the poland's role is falling because the key territory is germany I, I'm sorry to say that all that we could have in Poland and from Poland, we already have it. Perhaps you can actually provide more, but this is basically within the same kind of requirement. It will not be something different. The key thing is what Germany is going to do, because we understand the European contours are going to depend on the policy of Germany. If we're talking about the weakness of Europe, we're talking about the weakness of Germany first and foremost. If we're talking about the transformation of Europe, we're talking about the transformation of Germany first and foremost, because they're not doing anything. I don't know how you can do it, how you can impact it, but it's very important that both you and us manage to change the stance and position of Brussels, Berlin and Washington. It's very important before, because what you are, what is it that you are like us and we are like you because you and i us had this sense of devalued security for many decades we understand each other very much in this respect what you had 75 and 81 the martial law and others uh, other things that is very similar to what we're having so i don't know i can only thank you so much for your help i don't know what other opportunities can be granted what well, what i want to ask it's a very big ask we would like uh, to get our ukrainian uh, back ukrainians back from poland and not only from poland because we are afraid of that and poland should understand us we understand that many of them are going to be assimilated in poland and there's a huge social demographic uh, problem for ukraine ukraine uh, has the largest number of its youngest ukrainians there it's who were supposed to go to school to universities and there's a huge problem if we're going to lose them for us and for ukraine it's sustainability of ukraine it's going to be a huge problem for ukraine so please do something so that would be easy for these people to make this feeling easy for ukraine to get back to ukraine i can 
fantasize a lot, but me, all my fantasies are not going to be va worth much. Thank you very much for that appeal. And we're going to spread this appeal. And the question for Mr. Hlibovitsky, with the request and reference to the previous statements, I, I would like to, uh, I would like to sort of pose a specific question to you. Uh, various analysts talk about the resilience under this crisis, not only the army, but also the state, the public service, the success of the decentralization, and other reforms that have been implemented. To what extent could you confirm this observation that that was not too fast and whether they were talking about this consolidated approach to uh, whatever needed to be done in that respect. So what is the dynamic of this situation? I think the dynamic here is very fast. Ukrainians learn very quickly. Ukrainians are gaining a new skills very quickly. We can see that this network based nature of the Ukrainian society it provides us provides uh, a chance for someone to find a solution which is very quickly distributed along the entire network. The challenge is the hierarchy, building a hierarchy, a structure or structures. It seems to me that institutions building and the form, forming new rules will be the biggest challenge. We now have a political team at in power that is attempting to simplify the rules and to simplify or limit the institutions. And respectively, we will stay after the war to what extent this position is going to be changed, whether it's going to be an ideological or this was a matter of a populist choice. I do hope this was uh, uh, this is the latter one, because from what I know professionally, uh, tells me makes me think it's the former. I would say that with every subsequent iteration, the Ukrainians uh, conduct uh, implement reforms in yet better and better. And what has been help, helping us over the last 30 years is the fact that changes were taking place, were occurring slowly. In fact, that has in that was enabling us to be more mature in every next iteration to uh, approach the changes in a more profound way and in a broader way to, uh, facing each challenge in a more profound way and there was no there was not no sense of saturation that very often occurred in those countries who conducted the reforms quickly and their society sort of got relaxed and they stopped uh, defending either democracy or the achievements of some kind of other kinds, whether the free, be it freedom or the com com uh, or competitiveness of the economy. Now, this war has crystallized the processes very profoundly. Uh, we have an accelerated course of events. And echoing what Professor Herzog has just said, I can say that demographically, we are, we in fact, found ourselves in the next decade after 2030 and respectively we need to get used to the fact that the events have actually are, are, are went ahead of our ability ability to adapt to them and this we will have to augment our ability to adapt to these events. I'm sure the Ukrainians, Ukrainians will uh, be able to handle the reforms and the challenges that we're facing. I'm absolutely convinced that our diversity that Natalia Humenyuk is talking, was talking about is our strength. And therefore, the question is rather about something else. The question is, what is going to be the price that this war will cost us? If Ukraine is going to bleed slowly, as it's happened, as is the case now, without a sufficient resource support from the West, and this is 
a, a light version of the support. The easiest thing that can be done is to give money and uh, to give some weapons. This is not the support that does not bring sacrifice and does not give this daily support. And we're not getting enough of this support. Then more complex decisions will have to be made. This war is not only about Ukraine, it's about China, it's about the about BRICS, about the trade rules, about global trade rules, about values versus private interests, as we can observe in the case of Germany, and not only Germany. Therefore, it seems to me that what is most important now is to provide Ukrainians with the, with the ability to do their job and not to complicate the situation, which is already difficult. And I agree that Poland's contribution is fantastic, but I really regret the years that we've lost previously. I was part of the expert group that the Batori Foundation and Varian Science Foundation were uh, working on in terms of Polish-Ukrainian relations. We wasted a lot of years due, due to the discussions on the history and how it poisoned our relations. We talked about the past while we, were ha we had to speak about the future and let this be our lesson. Thank you very much. Actually, th those were very much the last words, especially, that you've provided. We're going to construct our future meetings about Ukraine, but that also sets us for future discussions about Ukraine. We are convinced that that future is happening and f being formed in Ukraine and our potential work with Ukraine. We're going to talk about it and plan for it. Our time has come to an end. I would like to thank you for this fascinating discussion and conversation that hasn't, of course, exhausted this subject matter, but has shown us uh, and the uh, has demonstrated the set of questions we have to do discuss and map things out for us that we need to talk about. I do hope that those who watched us understand it much or a little bit uh, and they, they managed to get some idea uh, of what they need to improve about the understanding of what's happening in Ukraine and what will be happening in Ukraine. And I would like to say that that Mr. Ivan Helbovitsky, Ms. Natalia Humenyuk, Yaroslav Ritsak, and Pani Maria Zolkina were our guests today. And with regard to the public, Ms. Natalia Minkovic, Pan Aleksandr Yakimovic was our interpreter, Viktor Shevchenko was our interpreter, and Tigachmel Igachmelevska and Jakub Malik were our interpreters. Thank you very much to everyone for the participation and for the pre preparation of this meeting. I'd like to thank everybody for the discussions that we had, and I wish all of you and all of us, and especially all of you, so that you would win this war uh, so that you could as soon as possible be able to speak under in living in peaceful con conditions